Yeah, in terms of space, using of space, I think it's pretty, um, the, the biggest change over the last five or so, probably five to eight years has been just staff wellbeing. Um, and it started with the simple things like a vendor trip facility. So all of a sudden some showers um, is what, and some bike racks were what people were after. And that was sort of eight or so years ago, um, right through now to all the amenity that employers are expecting to be able to offer their staff as part of the building that they choose to occupy um, and we see that as part of our new developments so you know that's everything from simple things like access to natural light access to open spaces fresh air um, the end of trip is a given so it's expected that there's going to be bike racks and towels and showers and that's just a given that's no longer a, you know a request it's like that's a tick the box it's there um, you know we look at different ratings like neighbors energy was obviously the big one. Um, now the expectation is the building's going to be run economically and sustainable. And we're looking at things like well ratings, which is what I just discussed. It's more about how people use the space. Um, and that's again, natural light, fresh air, uh, food offerings. So, you know, the, the cafe in the ground floor is great, but they don't want the greasy takeaway shop. They want something that provides fresh food and healthy food for, for people to choose from. Um, so that well being being piece is definitely a big one um, you know you're seeing in new buildings now even running um, lunchtime Pilates or yoga classes uh, bringing in experts to talk about whether it's mental health men's health women's health um, you know anything in relation to that healthy style of life and getting that balance between work and and life um, so that's probably a really big push in terms of how space is now being utilized it's no longer just walking into a building coming into your office doing your work and going home the expectation is that the building will offer a lot more than that um, I think the other side of um, expectation is flexibility of space so tenants having access to other spaces within the building that allows them to grow or, or contract without having to worry about entering new leases or handing back space or you know signing up for five years so flexibility is probably a big one and that's where I think um, not so much a partnership in terms of a business partnership but having a co-working group or a service office group within a building actually allows other tenants the benefit of upsizing or downsizing for projects um, and that that flexibility is a big one for tenants these days so they're probably the two biggest ones that i've seen in the last sort of five to eight years and where's i think who's, it's who's definitely the staff it's the the staff attraction and retention um, you know generally we've got a younger workforce coming in and every employer wants access to the best staff um, and if they're people graduating or, or you know out of uni for a, a couple of years I think when you look back at how people learn these days so I I noticed it when I my daughter enrolled in primary school we had an open day and this is primary school they don't learn in linear desks they learn in little pods so there's a pod of six and the preppies sit around in a pod of six and grade one two up to six and then they go to high school and it's the same scenario and then they go to uni and it's even more so like unis are collaborative spaces these days they're not the lecture halls that I'm used to and so you think if they've got their whole education years in that environment, the last thing they want to do is walk into an office with a traditional workspace. They, they just look at that and I think go, where am I? What year am I in? So I think that's driven that sort of collaborative and that, um, for want of a better word, hot desking or um, agile working environment where you come in, you don't have allocated spaces, you can sit wherever you, you need to sit for that particular day, depending on what you're working on. So I think, the, the next generation of workforce has driven it to a large degree. I think um, in addition to that, there's probably been a lot more study around well-being and that has probably driven the fact that people don't need to sit in their little office all day without talking to anyone around them. And so that more open environment um, has been generated. The offset of that is space is being utilised more economically and that can definitely transfer to rent being paid. So in the past where someone needed a thousand square meters, they now can have 700 because they're using the space more efficiently. So I think there's certainly cost 
benefits to it, but that's not the sole driver of it. I think a lot of it is workforce retention and attraction of staff, particularly the younger generation. I think there's definitely the, the flexible working is a huge push and I think if workplaces are moving towards um, not having designated desks, so you know, for example we've got a 65% ratio, so there's only 18 workstations for 26 staff, so the expectation is that on any given day you'll be working from home, you'll be travelling, you might not be working or you'll be on holidays. Um, so th there's actually an encouragement to work where you need to work that particular day. You don't have to be in the office to get your job done. Um, so that that's a, a you know that's quite convenient for a lot of people, um, particularly trying to get the work-life balance with kids or other family duties or caring duties or whatever it might be. Or just you need to be at home for a day for a delivery and you can work from home and it's seamless. So I think that, that comes down to the employer and actually supporting that working environment and making sure that staff have got the equipment they need to be able to work from home or work from another place seamlessly. Um, I think a lot of people appreciate that and I think the connotation that working from home is a day on the golf course is slowly being eroded because a lot of people find it a lot more efficient and a lot more productive to work from home because they don't have the natural disruption of what an office may bring. Um, so I think that's a, that's a big one, particularly when we are looking at um, agile workplaces where there aren't 100 desks for 100 people. There's, there's a lower allocation because the expectation is not everyone will be in every single day. Yeah, which is great, works for me. <laughs> I work from home one day a week, so that, that's been something for the last seven years for me. Um, and I certainly encourage my team to do it when they need to. And I think, you know, the underlying thing with that is trust. It's, you know, people will still get their job and what they need to get done done. Um, and you've got the trust that they'll do it in the time. It doesn't need to be between nine and five. As long as it's done when it needs to be done, it can be done at 11 o'clock if that suits them. Um, everyone works differently. So yeah, I think trust is the underlying thing with the, the flexible working. Yeah, I think one of the things we're looking at in, in all our developments, which are you know underway and being um, delivered within the next two to three years, is definitely the smart building approach. So it's having um, a, a building system, the backbone, which everything feeds into. So we can really drill down and see what spaces of the building are being utilised, what's underutilised, how can we change the way um, they're set up or fitted out or managed so that there's better utilisation. So we don't want parts of the building that should be utilised to be empty because it's, it's just not working in the in, in its current format. So that's part of our um, latest development here in Melbourne. So that really smart building backbone. backbone. It's very IT driven, like everything is technology driven. I think um, there's a real push to connect with our tenant customers and making sure that they're getting more out of their building than just a space to work. So, you know, a lot of that is Again, technology, like everyone has a smartphone and an app and, you know, the, the idea of someone coming into the office or coming into a building and their mobile phone acknowledging that they've arrived and, and making their journey to their workplace really seamless is fantastic. But we still need to understand that a lot of people like human interaction. Not everyone just wants to have their phone in front of them all day and, and have no human interaction. So there's that fine balance between creating a community within the building, but also making the arrival experience and, and the journey very easy for them. Um, so, you know, IT is really driving it. It's, it's secure Wi-Fi networks in public spaces so that, you know, you can move from your office down to open space downstairs and keep working on your security a network without interruption. So I think those sort of things is really where we're moving towards. It's nice to have free Wi-Fi, but it's it's not the same if you can't access the work that you need to access if you want to work outside on a sunny day. Um, Community is a big thing. So we've, you know, we've got a couple of buildings around the country where we've got some great 
concierge and um, resources in place that really build this community atmosphere and you know we have buildings that run trivia nights every six months and a lot of tenants get involved in that and really feel like they're part of something more than just a space where they come and get their work done. Um, so we feel that that's, that's a big part of I think what's still coming is just really that connection and building that relationship with our, our customers. I mean we've had tenants who you know, I've had relationships with the whole time I've been here, which is coming up to 15 years. Um, and it's just nice to have that relationship. And they've been with Charter Hall in a Charter Hall building the whole time. So, you know, that, that's the ideal is to not lose them from whether it's a different building, but still Charter Hall. Um, that's kind of, you know, that's always been our focus. And now we're just looking at how IT can help that be even easier and, and better connection. Yeah, I think there's definitely been a push for the, the large campus style floors for large users of space. Um, and I think that's why Docklands has been quite successful is that they were, we were developers were able to build, you know, buildings of 2000 square meter floor plates plus for the really large users of space so that they can have a lot of people over a floor and, and you know, over say 10 floors instead of 20 floors. Um, so I think that, you know, when you look at the development of the last 10 or so years, that's what we've seen. That is going to change because Melbourne just doesn't have the sites to do that any longer. So now I think it's going to have to be, um, tenants are probably needing to get their head around if they want to be in a brand new building, the floor plates are going to be smaller. They're probably going to be somewhere between 1,000 and 1,500 square metres. Um, the offset is they'll be back in the CBD grid, um, but it'll be the amenity that draws them to the building. So, you know, we see new buildings coming up East End Collins Street with a, you know, a floor plate of about 1,200, 1,300 square metres, which traditionally tenants would go no too small, but it's East End Collins Street and the amenity and the address will attract tenants to that building. So I think there's a change in mindset just because the development sites have now really dried up in Melbourne. Um, and so it's a push for getting a well located new development and the amenity that gets created with that is what will attract tenants to that space. Um, so I think that's definitely probably what's to come. Um, there's still a few larger sites around but between planning laws and smaller sites I think the floor plates would generally be less than the you know the 2,000 meters that everyone has requested in recent times. Um, that's definitely a change and I think you know that as I said the amenity the the staff um, health and well-being side will definitely you know be front and center focus um, you just need to look at some of the end of trips recently delivered in some of our leading buildings down here where millions of dollars are being spent on it um, that's how important it is to to maintaining you know a full building of tenants basically yep well i finished uni a long time ago nearly 20 years so at that point i saw myself being in property management, which I did for a number of years, and then working with a couple of fund managers, saw myself wanting to move into the asset management arena, which eventually happened. Um, and then I probably saw myself working in that for quite some time, which is what happened. Now my role is more focused, there's a little bit of asset management, there's a lot of people management, um, and there's more involvement in um, getting involved with the design phase of development buildings, which I'm really loving because I've I've had quite I've had a bit of exposure to that over the past decade. Um, but now with Charter Hall being quite active in the development space, it's it's growing more and more, and it's really um, that change of focus from the developers, whereby they are actually now seeing the benefit of having asset management involvement from day one, because. There's no point d developing building and handing over a building that then isn't functional on day one from an operational point of view. So being able to get you know the A asset management team involved from day one, where we look at something and go, we want a good design, but we need it to be operational and actual practical for tenants who use the space, um, and we can make those adjustments at the very start, as opposed to then having to to just live with it or making some very expensive adjustments once the building's built. So I think my role today is is a bit more diverse than what I thought it would be. Um, I'm actually really I really enjoy the development space. I wouldn't want to be a development manager, but I like being involved in it and being part of a, a bigger team um, where my sort of insights and experience can add some value. Um, 
Yeah, but I still enjoy being in the asset management space and being in touch with what's happening on a market level, leasing and sales and, and, and that sort of thing. So, yeah, it's nice to sort of, you know, have a few different things to focus on each day. It certainly keeps it interesting. 